Hello and welcome to Blues Talk, the official Birmingham City podcast. My name is Callum Denning, Dale Moon with me too, and coming up we'll be reflecting on a tough night away at West Bromwich Albion and discussing that refereeing decision. We'll also look ahead to a tough couple of home games against promotion contenders, while a man who knows Leeds well will be joining us with assistant manager Pep Quartet here on Blues Talk. All that and a slightly different quickfire question on the way here on Blues Talk. The Blues Talk podcast with Dale Moon and Callum Denning. As I said, Blues Talk, my name is Callum Denning, Dale Moon here as well. We're going to talk about West Brom, we're going to talk about Leeds, we're going to talk about Sheffield United. But first, Dale, the EFL PNS Commission met a fortnight ago, dated our podcast. We've got a points deduction, <laughs> but we've got that clarity. Yeah, and I think that's what uh, I think we alluded to it in the last podcast. I think everyone was sick and tired of it rumbling on and hanging over the club. And now, finally, we've been put out of our misery. Nine points deducted. So, um, yeah, we now sit five points above the, the bottom three. So it is a big blow. There's no getting away from it. But given all the reports in the last few months where, to be honest, I think a lot of the media outlets were guessing. Nobody really, truly knew what the verdict was going to be. And um, nine, nine points with no embargo in the summer, um, no fine, no points deduction to start next season, which was obviously a big concern. Um, I know we're not happy about it, but we have to face up to it. It is what it is. Uh, and we now have, what, seven games remaining as we sit here mm-hmm. to make sure that we don't get pulled into a, a dogfight yeah. at the bottom. I think for me, it was just relief to get it done. You know, I sat there... Now, we kind of tempted fate a little bit. We recorded our podcast the day before it went out, ended it by speaking about the need to have this decision through to get that clarity. I think about 10 minutes before the podcast <laughs> went live, news started breaking in the national media that we were getting this deduction. So, I mean, we, we did kind of tempt it a little bit there. Yeah. But, yeah, like I said, relief to just get it out of the way, isn't it? I think the so. speculation about 12 points. That's all, that's all right. From my point of view, uh, we've known that this is hanging over us for a while now. And you do wonder, as you know, Gary Monk obviously has suggested all the way through, that it's not been a distraction. But you know, you're looking at the table and there's always the asterisk next to us mm. in our minds to say, well, that's pending what the verdict was going to be. We all thought of had an inkling that it was going to be a points deduction. I preferred it wouldn't, given the fact that we were in touch and distance of the playoffs. But... The manager will tell you that's not been our aim since the start of the season. It's been to make sure we don't get dragged into a, a final day drama as we have done a three of the last five yeah. seasons. So it looks like we, we're we a little too close for comfort at the minute. Um, but it's still in our own hands. And given the form since August, since the start of the season, we haven't been a bottom of the table side. Um, no chance. I know we're not in great form at the minute, but uh, I'd like to think we've got enough quality, enough fight still in the dressing room. And it does refocus the minds. You know, you, you think about mid-table teams that head towards the last hang, um, handful of games. Uh, they can be on the beach, as the saying goes. Mm-hmm. Not that this team would be. I, I doubt that they're the sort of character that would be, but it's human nature to drop off it a little bit when you know you're safe and you know that the playoffs um, aren't within reach. That can't be the case now. We know that we're dangerously close, perilously close to that mm-hmm. bottom three. So let's refocus the minds, go again and give us a, a bit of an injection of life into what is going to be a tough last seven games. Listen, you spoke about final day drama. There's Bolton, Bristol City, Fulham, all in the recent years. But I think it's almost a bit weird, but we seem to play better with our backs against the wall, don't mm. we? And that's the situation we've been left in now. Mm. Do you think that's going to give the boys a little bit of that fight? Not as if it was really overly needed to begin with, but... Almost a sense of injustice, I suppose, now that is going to encourage them over the line to mm. secure safety, which has always been the aim. As yeah, the I think said. so. When they're up against it, this club seems to get be galvanised. And like you say, I, I think back to the Huddersfield game here yeah. and the Harry Redknapp where the chips were down, the Fulham game last season. There's been key games over the past few years. And when you know you really need to get a result and you feel like the world's against you, and it's Birmingham City with that siege mentality, it seems to bring out the best of this football club. And yeah, hopefully that does have that effect again. 
because um, as I think we're going to talk about, there's some tricky fixtures still to come. Mm. There's teams to play who have something to play for themselves. Every side has a motivation to win a game now. Um, so, we, But then the positive is we play sides that are around us in the wrong end of the table and with the exception of these next two coming up, you want to be playing teams where you can take points off them and you know, six pointers is a term we hear, but you look at Ipswich and Rotherham mm-hmm. in particular, they're big games that we still have to look forward to. Massively, yeah. We'll speak a little bit about the running in just a moment, but let's have a look back now at West Brom. Midlands derby, away at the Hawthorns. Started off so strongly, didn't <coughs> that first half? Gary Gardner getting on the score sheet after seven minutes. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, I thought it was a really good derby game, actually. Uh, yes, it's not the derby for either side, but still had that little edge to it. The atmosphere with, I mean, our fans that night, I've seen a lot come out of West Brom and Derby and credit to them. I don't know what the atmosphere is like at the Hawthorns week in, week out, but I thought the away end was absolutely phenomenal. It's properly Um, vociferous, wasn't it? It's (laughs) all you could hear throughout the match. Yeah, it was um, was absolutely fantastic to watch, especially when the goal went in. They're the moments you wish you were part of that away end. But um, the game itself had that little edge to it. I thought we were fantastic for 45 Mm. minutes in particular. Um, stop West, West Bromwich Albion for playing similar to what happened down here against West Brom at St Andrews they tried to keep insisting on playing the ball through the thirds trying to slice Blues open we were so compact and we've had a few chances uh, after the goal I think to double our lead we've had mm-hmm. a couple of chances Jack Magoma just loses his yeah. foot at the vital moment Shea as well having the opportunity yeah Shea has a, has a chance so um we created openings, which again, managers of tell you, you worry when you're not creating chances. We score, which is brilliant. You get the first goal in the game. Um, guards his celebration. Looked like they'd worked on something because he's darted straight for the straight dugouts. Straight there, no hesitation. Um, so it's clearly something they'd worked on, as they have all season with set pieces. And um, I thought we were really good value for the lead. Um, but as you expect, a side who's up there challenging... Uh, I don't think they've given up hope of an automatic spot talking to one or two members of their backroom staff after the game uh, they still feel like the run they're on they won two going into that game mm-hmm. three now with the victory over ourselves so um, they're a side with lots of quality you only have to look at the team sheet even on the bench they can bring on players internationals and how Robson Carnu made a difference um, but I think the whole game hinges on a really poor decision which I think we're mm. going to talk about but I think we can consider ourselves very unfortunate to come away from there with nothing to show for our efforts, you, you know, you, yeah, we get undone a little bit um, with the penalty decision. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I just felt that we were we'd done enough on the night, especially going ahead for the second time. Lukas Jukovic's goal. Well, this is the thing I wanted to speak about. Four months off the score sheet, how good was it for him to get back on last, you, um, on Friday night? You saw the relief in him. You, the passion coming out in Lukas Jukic, who's a very articulate, considered player. Yeah, very much so. Um, but you could see that it was just months of being built up. And he, you know, he, he says all the right things, Juki. But deep down, he'll be wanting to score as a forward does, especially when he racks up 10 so quickly mm-hmm. to then not score since November. Um, and it's a Juki goal, ball yeah. to the back stick, and there he is to nod it down. And he loved, loved the celebrations in front of the away end. Um, but it's just a shame there. We get our noses in front for the second time. You score twice away from home. You expect to come away with at least something. And um, then the big decision, which I think changes the game, really. Listen, let's talk about that then. Conor Mahoney, he's coming across. Mm. West Brom about to break into the box. For me, first of all, I think Conor wins the ball. Especially when you look at it from the behind angle. Secondly, it's not in the box, is it? No. The big disappointment... I mean, Townsend... For the first, only time in the game, I think, gets the better of Maxime Collin, mm-hmm. who I thought was our man of the match on the night. I thought he was yeah. tremendous, Max. Especially in that first half. I think there's one piece of defending um, where he just puts the cover on, s- s- comes sweeping across, then keeps his call to play Blues out, and we yeah. start to go on the counter-attack, and it just shows all the class that he's got. I think there was um, one moment as well in the first half where he gets it from a throw and megs the West Brom defender... We lose the ball, but then straight away breaks, makes the block at the other end. Yeah, he, he, he was, um, it goes to show why the gaffer put him straight back in. You know, Wes Harding never lets us down whenever mm-hmm. he's called upon, but just Max's experience and quality on the ball and reading of the game, he just gives you that little bit of um, solidity. Side tracking a little bit from the penalty thing, but one of the most underrated players in the league, do you think? Yeah, I think there's yeah. a debate to be had. You, know, you, look, you look at good fullbacks. Um, Max Ahrens is very good at Norwich, mm. good young fullback, linked with a few Premier League clubs, obviously riding high. 
Um, but I think Maxime Collin, on his day in particular, yeah. could challenge at the very back, best of these fullbacks in the in the championship. But yeah, going back to the incident, uh, he gets nutmegged in off the left hand side, and Conor Mahoney does the right thing actually as a winger. He's almost doubling up on the the West Bromwich Albion wide man. Mm-hmm. And he just goes to ground. So he does give the referee a decision to make. Now, our angle, actually, I thought it's a penalty straight away. I thought he's gone to ground and he's caught the uh, the winger. Um, having seen it again, you're right. Not only does he get the ball and he's also half a yard outside the box. Yeah. I've seen a lot of pundits try and justify the decision by saying, well, he lifts his leg once, you know, the contact's inside the box and he lifts his leg to trip Townsend. Um, for me, I think it's soft. Yeah. It's very soft. And, you, you know... When there's so much riding on it, you hear Neil Warnock this weekend talking about the offside decision. You need you need assistance and referees to get those right. Because what's what's there to say that we don't find ourselves in the midst of a relegation battle on the final day? Heaven forbid it rests on goal difference or a yeah. point, and you well, look it happens back on Cardiff. Yeah, yeah, that's throwing them right in the deep end in the Premier League. Yeah, you, you look back at those decisions, and um, that's a, that's a really disappointing one. And and you look back to the Preston game, which is only. The last, the last time we played. Yeah. Uh, and there's another poor refereeing decision there. And I hate... It's not a sour grapes. This isn't me sitting here being bitter about the whole but thing. But it's happened all season. And they say it evens itself out and all that. But you just feel like, given everything that's happened against the club this season, that you can't help but feel hard done by, especially with that one. So, And that makes it too... All, then the momentum swings back mm-hmm. the home, to the home uh, side. Their crowd then are lifted... Um, and Blues were up against it a little bit. so It's a bit of a pain because we silenced the home crowd. They piped up a little bit when they got the equaliser. Juki mm. goes and scores. Hawthorns is silent. All you can hear is Blues fans singing Keep Right On and various other songs. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, get the penalty, score that, and immediately it just seems to shift to Albion. And that, I think, is what's eventually led to our defeat. Yeah, but yeah. That, that's a frustrating little bit. And I know they'll be a little bit frustrated with the third goal. I know the clearance initially goes up in the air and they think Digger and Harley both charge the ball. I think Harley gets closest to it, actually. But Jake Livermore, Livermore catches it well. Yeah. It's, it's a low drive. And a Camp's got down to his right-hand side. It's probably not in the corner, which will be annoy him a little bit mm-hmm. that he didn't get behind it. But, you know, when you strike a ball that cleanly and he's not too far out, you know, it may, maybe it's um, it's a little harsh on Blues to say we should have kept that one at bay. But, like I say, you look at the performance in general to go away to a sider in good form who are up at the right end of the table... And I thought for 45 minutes we were nearly dominant. I mean, they were getting quite restless with the way they were trying to play. Um, but we didn't take that. Se- that second goal would have been nice. Yeah. Um, but then you get yourselves 2-1 up again. So I don't want to keep alluding to the, the decision, but you do feel like the game was pivotal, that that moment was pivotal. Now, we move on. We've got Leeds and Sheffield United on the way. Before we have a little bit of a conversation about what we've got coming up, two big home games... I think we should speak to a man who knows the uh, the former of those two clubs quite well. Yeah, Pep Clotet obviously was Gary Monk's assistant both uh, well, at Leeds United. And I know he's still uh, fondly thought of actually at Ellen Road. Uh, obviously, he's big on Twitter. And whenever he, he posts about Leeds or we, when we've, we've played Leeds earlier in the season, a lot of the Leeds fans, I think, still... F- still feel quite fondly towards Pep. Uh, clearly, there's a tactician in there. We're privy to a lot of um, of the training ground drills and sessions mm-hmm. that are put, up, put on at Wast Hills. And um, Pep's at the heart of a lot of those, particularly set pieces. So uh, an understanding of the game that he has obviously uh, leads a side who, um, back down at St Andrews, getting, getting a result there would have pleased him. It was like the birth of Shea Adams, wasn't it, earlier in the yeah. season? It seemed to kickstart his... Fantastic season, but uh, yeah, just to pick his brains really about his time both at Leeds and at, at Blues and um, one or two hobbies outside of football as well. The Blues Talk Podcast. Right, so we're here at the Trillion Trophy Train Centre. Pep Clotet joining us here on Blues Talk. Pleasure to have you with us. Thank you. I think, you know, we've got to start on your pathway here to Birmingham, your world tour. <laughs> just tell us a little bit about where you've been, how you got there and how it all culminated here in the West Midlands. Yeah, well, um, as everyone, you know, I started um, in my, my own country, in Catalonia, and and where I managed a few different clubs, and and then eventually Espanyol bought me to join their academy, so I did under the 17s and the 19s, and the reserve team as a manager, and yeah, it was it was very happy years, very good years, because the, the academy setup was fantastic, and, and we were able to 
win many trophies in many leagues and but eventually I felt that that I wanted to to do something else to test other kind of competitions uh, not from academy level but reserve the reserve team in Espanol was pretty strong and was already playing the second division so it was a tough competition but then I had the opportunity to go to to Malmo and and Sweden so I, I really didn't hesitate because that's another passion I have you know to to travel and to to learn about different cultures and this mm -hmm. kind of thing so I went to to Sweden and it was fantastic we won the league that year and classified the team to Europe then eventually managed in Sweden uh, as well in Norway and then back um, with who was my former academy director in Espanol who signed for a really big project in Malaga when Pellegrini was the manager so I went to, Mal to Malaga to manage the, the reserve team um, <clears throat> And then after that, I got a call from Michael Aldo to say if, if I would like to join him in, in Swansea. And then I went, and that's how I, I met Gary. And when Gary became the manager, then I was system manager with him. And eventually went to Leeds. And uh, when he we went to Middlesbrough, I, I managed Stocksford. And then we got back together here in, in Birmingham mm -hmm. last season. Do you mind the travelling, Pep? Does the fact that you've been in many countries and not settled in one particular place? No, 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 no. I love, I love traveling. Mm -hmm. um, I love seeing different cultures mm -hmm. in the same context as well, because it's massive difference as well from uh, and and good things from from everywhere. You know, mm -hmm. my my time in in Swansea in South Wales and my time in in Yorkshire was mm -hmm. was fantastic as well as well here in the, in Oxford, Birmingham. Mm -hmm. you know, I really I really like it here. I don't mind, especially long distances. I don't mind. It's more the the short things that get me a little bit more <laughs> <laughs> like. Uh, of like the other day when I uh, there was no, I, I needed to go home for for two days and I was no no flight from Birmingham I needed yeah. to go to to Bristol uh, this hour and a half or two hours <laughs> there from here to Bristol yeah, that yeah. gets gets you a little bit more they are more nasty you know yeah, yeah, yeah. Do it. go yeah. to Norway to work for example that's yeah. fantastic and I, I've been so lucky in my life to yeah. be able to do it did you always want to be a coach or did you fall into it or how did you get into it was you did you start off wanting to be a player. Yeah, yeah, I want to be a player, yeah. and uh, as everyone else, but obviously only only few are lucky enough or good enough to yeah, make yeah. it, you know. And then, then eventually, then turn out to be um, not my path, and and I really didn't want to do to the football. But music was my my real passion. I think. Music, yeah, was it? Yeah, yeah, and uh, but but on the side of of that, I was doing a little bit of coaching my hometown because they they asked me to, and and. And, and well, one thing led to the other, and, mm -hmm. and eventually I turned out to be better as that, that than as a musician. Yeah, yeah. I think we come on to the music because that's yeah, obviously yeah. a big part of what we want to talk about. Okay. I just wanted to pick your brains about Espanol because they brought so many players through into like La Liga, and their re academies renowned. Did you enjoy working with young players? That's still something that you enjoy doing now. Yeah, especially at that time in in Espanol, it was a fantastic time because mm -hmm. we did have the resources to do it. Yeah. As well, we did have the need to do it in the first team because we were selling a lot of players. There was a uh, was a moment in the first team that a lot of players were coming and going. Yeah. So the club really needed a strong academy to, to be able to to, to feed and support mm -hmm. the, the first team, and we did it. Mm -hmm. And and yeah, I don't know exactly numbers, but more than 130 in, mm -hmm. in like in 10 years made it to La Liga from Espanol. Yeah, and that's that's a lot of players for Espanol or for someone else. Yeah, and. And Spanish has been good to 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 recycle, or give opportunities to young players, and then mm -hmm. then to develop. Like for example, now this player was in Liverpool, Coutinho. He played in Espanol mm -hmm. before before going to Liverpool, and then now in Barcelona. Mm -hmm. So it's this kind of club, you know. And they and they develop uh, very well the the young players, making it through. And and still nowadays, most of the first first team players in Espanol, uh, they were with me in the reserve team. Yeah, so, yeah fantastic. Interesting. It's interesting. Tell us about your music passion then, Pep. You say that was your main passion oh, yeah. was music. Yeah, it was. And now it's only a little bit, yeah, you listen to a lot of things, you know. Yeah. Um, I grew up listening to what everyone listens to, really, what you, what you hear in the radio and, what, yeah. and the influences of your family and your friends. But um, I was, I wanted to learn how to play guitar and to learn about music. So I started early and, and, and learned it and played as, as, as good as I could, you know. But I had a, a person who, who was a major, inf major influence in me to, to not only to help me and, and teach me a lot on, was a guitar teacher, mm -hmm. uh, to, to help me and teach on the guitar, but as well to, 
to widen my my musical um, learning and my musical taste and that's how I came across with with um, with blues and with jazz especially with jazz that's what I enjoy the most when, when, when you can play if you can play obviously now yeah. now will it be worse than before because you don't <laughs> practice that much but yeah and that widened me a lot learned a lot about the harmony how different different key figures in the, in the music actually are guiding right. what, what we listen and how this influence and, and their thinking transforms when you layer it a lot, mm-hmm. get get transforms and transformed in in the pop music that yeah. everyone really listens, you know. So there's like the influence. So I, I think every everything starts in there, and and I always loved jazz, but at the same time I I love I love metal, yeah. you know, and and so. And the fact that I'm here in Birmingham was <laughs> jazz always and been metal are like eat, eat different yeah. ends of the spectrum. You know, like jazz is this calming yeah. sort of culture, it was, and then heavy metal was like you can completely imagine Aussie on the saxophone, can't you? Yeah, no, yeah. not quite. No, but I don't know. You when you get when you listen to some to some, uh, yeah, you tend to think that jazz is is relaxing, you mm-hmm. know, but. Um, uh, there's there's some pieces in jazz that goes mm-hmm. on on the metronome that goes on 280. You know right. that's 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 not applicable to right. to to heavy metal. It's too quick. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but jazz is jazz for me is the uh, the way that they use the harmony and mm-hmm. the tension on on creating the chord and, and to sustain that melody. That's the difference. You know, when in jazz you use seven tensions or or even more um, from five to seven or sometimes more. And then um, normal rock music or whatever they, they use, they may use three, you know, right. to to make the chord. So that tension is what what it gives this this depth to jazz music. Right. And eventually, influences all the rest of the music. Now mm-hmm. what you hear now is more more both than what we were here listening twenty years ago. You know, mm-hmm. so slowly that comes. In. But hair metal I like because I I really like the minor melodies and and the use of the minor in into create the tunes and especially the British um, metal because. I think they achieved a, a particularly a particular sound, mm-hmm. uh, very characteristic and and very wide as well. You know, favorite musician of all time, Miles Davis. Yeah, great yeah. pick. Do you think you know you talk about learning instruments like learning the guitar? Do you think some of the discipline stuff from that can carry over into coaching? Do you think you took that away? Yeah, it's about yeah, especially it's the same real skill. It's the same skills about about learning and about be opening. I think when you when you study guitar, you it's it's always a block because you're gonna try to learn something that you cannot do, and at the moment, so you, you need to practice it and and slow it down and, and and eventually develop the skill and the coordination to be able to do it. But first, you need to understand it, mm-hmm. and that's why where, where the harmony comes comes into place and. And when that influence from, from when, you, when you start studying a little bit the, the jazz um, uh, harmony, you know, you you get enriched in this sense, you know, because you start hearing things that they, they are completely new and then you just want to do it. Mm-hmm. Um, when it comes to coaching, it's the same thing. It's about the same process. You you want uh, to be able to to help the players to develop, to to be better than on their skills that what they are now or to be more organized as a team than what they are now. So you need to break bridge that that level of 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 that learning process you know i think it's very similar on however we learn thing you know um you translate it to another one if you just got a first for knowledge pep do you just enjoy learning new things whether it's coaching music travel language it just seems to me like you just enjoy to develop your personal skills and yourself yeah i like that i like it because i think uh you always end up thinking that well, I want to be able to do something tomorrow that I cannot do today. You know? yeah. And you, you want to give this to to your kids and yeah. and, and to try to, to be better, you know. And and obviously it's, a, it's about self reflection. It's about accepting that there's always things that you can't control or you can and you don't know and just want to want to improve. And I think with the football teams, it's exactly the same. You want to be better in a year time than the way you are now. And and then you create a, a path and a, and a plan to to be able to do it. Same if you build an organization, it's the same. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I suppose be, having a family is the same, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Trying to be better every time altogether. So is it, that motivates me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And when it came to like coaching, who did you learn from there? Who were your inspirations in the football world? Well, I had him. I, I had him in the, was a good friend, very good friend of mine, and I was so lucky to meet him. To meet him is Giuseppe Semeli, who was a coach in in Catalonia, was a um, a teacher in the uh, a teacher in the Catalan a coaches school for the federation for the FA and and him it was a major influence because he 
uh, it really developed in me. I, I saw him as a role model as well on how, how to think about the game and how to improve at the game, mm-hmm. and how to, to develop a serious way of working and, and improving the teams and, and a very analytical approach to everything from, from tactical systems to set plays to, to developing skills to anything. So that was a major major in, mm. in my path then you got the influences from from everyone you know I uh, remember when I was in the university and uh, studying somewhere else not related to football obviously but 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 I uh, was next to it was close to where Barca was training and mm-hmm. then I remember I spent uh, that year I spent more more days <laughs> Watching <laughs> Louis van Gaal train <laughs> Barcelona than, than than attending class, you know, and that's not good. You don't need to do that as a kid. But know? that was education in itself. I yeah. think so because yeah. otherwise I would not have done it. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so it's good. And so Louis van Gaal as well. I saw a lot of the things that they were they were intriguing me. I saw them how how we developed them. Mm-hmm. I think he did a fantastic job on develop Barca because Barca was coming from a Cruyff uh, perspective, very mm-hmm. uh, where the player had the the. The player basically everything was was down to the player with mm-hmm. with a little bit of a philosophy. Mm-hmm. But Van Gaal put that philosophy into into structure, into organization of the team, organization of the club, and I think it made a ma- major impact in Barcelona. Mm-hmm. And and afterwards, been I get attracted by completely different ideas. Like Van Gaal is 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 similar in most ways to to some coaches, but I get attracted as well to to opposite ideas, and I want to learn how. You know, for me. There's been teams who changed this game and shaped this game, yeah. like like uh, Milan uh, from the late '80s, beginning yeah. of the '90s, with with Saki as a manager mm-hmm. that changed the game. You know, mm-hmm. like like Mitchell's w- with Holland changed the game as well mm-hmm. in the in the '70s. Well, Arrigo Saki changed the game because he started to to develop and be successful on the use of the zone marking right. that was not done before, and mm-hmm. and that changed the game. So I got very interested, and then. What happens, you know, you develop this ability or try to learn everything possible of it. And, and, and I remember calling Italian friends of mine because there was, there was really no internet much then. You know? Right. So calling Italian <laughs> friends of mine, is there any books there? Yeah, yeah. Amazon didn't exist then. You know? <laughs> yeah. So is there any books there or any videos? Someone, oh, I remember even calling the, the, the Catalan television. Uh, do you have any, any, any game from Milan on there? <laughs> And so they, they provide me a game. Milan played Real Madrid on a on a Champions League. Oh, my God, it was not even called then. <laughs> but like, yeah, yeah, you wait for cup. Uh, with uh, yeah, yeah. Or, yeah, Champions, Champions yeah, League group. Yeah. And <clears throat> so they gave me games, and I, I analyze it, and I have seen that game many times. So oh, hmm. Saki was a major influence as well, and and as well uh, now that we play Leeds, Marcelo Bielsa because. Uh, s- he managed Espanol, yeah. Yeah. Uh, early, early 2000s, nine, late 90s, v- very short spell because then he took the national team in Argentina. But I remember when I was taking my pro license in 2003, Argentina was on the same spot that we were having the license, at kind of San Jorge's Park in Barcelona, where they were training there, preparing for a, for a World Cup. Or well, 2002, that might be, yeah, for the yeah. World Cup, uh, I think it was in Japan. Japan, mm-hmm. South Korea. Yeah. And they were, they were preparing there, so they were there two weeks. I remember as well, I watched almost every training session then. And since then, I always follow when he was in Chile, or, mm-hmm. and then he came to Bilbao. So I, I always followed it and, and analyzed and, mm-hmm. and studied. And did the same thing as I did before, you know, try to get as many materials as, as possible. But not only those, those managers or those coaches that made a difference in the game, professional level, because there's, there's really good coaches, really good managers that they are doing the work um, on amateur level, you know, so yeah. that's why I get on with, with everyone really who, who loves the game. What I find quite interesting is, you know, you talk about trends and periods in time that changed the game. I think when certainly our generation were growing up, everyone looked to the Spanish side and tiki-taka football and you could see that coaches were trying to implement that around the world. Where do you see it now in terms of where, you know, what's the latest trend in coaching? What do you think, you know, whether you look at formations and tactics, you know, we play four four two here. Four four two used to be thought as an old fashioned formation, but now that seems to be coming back in. Four three three seems to, not just formations, but where do you see now the main coaching philosophy be focused around? I think the the game is changing a lot. Changed a lot last thirty years especially, even more if you take mm. it take it wider changed a lot from the physical side, you know, the, the, there's more demands on the players, mm-hmm. 
with more demands, you can be able to produce a different kind of game, a different kind of game. Um, like, for example, <clears throat> everyone plays his own market, for example, in Europe, mainly, mm -hmm. in Europe, right? Uh, here, maybe it'll be different. Here is more mixed, I think, here in England. Uh, like mixed marking, like yeah, this is your position, but then when when this is your man, then you do the work with your man. Or, or mm -hmm. people call it pressing, then you press your direct man, right. and then whoever press their own man, you know, right? If you take this to a to a point of doing it perfectly or doing it properly, mm -hmm. right? Then you set up a cover to 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 this, and then you have a a, a man marking system. Mm -hmm. The requirements to do a man marking system is mainly physical because you need to be physical as good as the opposition you play against. Stick with yeah, at least as quick as them or at least as strong as them because obviously you, you're you trying to avoid them playing, you know. But this grants you that you're able to to build counterattacks straight away because you have more pressure on, on whoever has the ball and all the all the possible options. You can do that on the zone marking as well, uh, but then you as well you require more organization because you need to, to get across and cover cover not only the one in possession but as well all the possible options, you know. Mm -hmm. What I think Man marking was used until really, really. Man marking systems were used until Saki developed his own marking in Milan mm -hmm. on late eighties, beginning of the nineties. So everyone was doing man marking before. And this isn't just from a set piece point of view. This is in open play. Yeah, in yeah. open play, in open play. And when Milan got very successful doing the zone marking, mm -hmm. then slowly everyone else adopted that, mm -hmm. and and they became to that. And what I see the future going is a little bit of a mix, you know, because there's the problem with the man marking is that if, if someone gets beaten 1v1, obviously everyone else doing the, the work with whoever the man is and the cover sometimes far away. So I see the future the future of the game will be... Makes it uh, both. Yeah, mm -hmm. it, because the people want to be able to put more pressure on whoever has the ball and the possible um, receivers of that ball, but as well to be more... Uh, more concerned about if you get beaten then you have the cover closer mm -hmm. because on the man market sometimes the cover is a little bit further away mm -hmm. so we will see a, a game in two ways we'll see most of the teams that will do um, complete pressing uh, setting up cover so we'll do a little bit of a mixed mm -hmm. mark marking system but at the same time some of the teams will will follow strict rules to be zoned but slowly those kind of teams I think I think they will you will see them uh, getting deeper and deeper and, and defending in deeper positions and using more counterattacks. So the, the world is really going, going like that. Yeah. But there really hasn't been a major change in the game since they changed the offside rule in the early 20s. Right. right? And, and that was uh, the international board decision. <clears throat> a rule That rule shaped the game. Uh, if there's no <clears throat> a big change like that mm. and the refs keep applying the rules as they should be applied, then really you will not see it. you will only see that the game is going to be a little bit more physical, a bit more intensity, a little bit more more pacey, but it will not be a major, major impact in, in the future. It's interesting. Do you ever get frustrated with players because you have this all these thoughts going through your head and a clear picture of how the game should be played and how you want players to play? Do you have to almost make it concise and clear for them and get just a few messages across? Yeah, I normally don't get frustrated with them because I get frustrated myself because the the mistake of the player is our mistake mm -hmm. because it's we either didn't because it doesn't matter how how many times we tell a player to do things. Uh, what we need to do is make the player do it, mm -hmm. right? So if the player cannot do it or he doesn't do it, is because we were not clear mm -hmm. or we didn't work it properly. So th that frustration comes on us, you know. Mm -hmm. Then with more experience, you understand that sometimes it's better to focus on the main points that you want to come across and, and develop very strong them, you know, mm -hmm. and then stick to it because uh, it takes a, a long time for the player to observe uh, uh, a new organization for the team and it takes very short time to blow it away. Mm. So that's why we don't go around and, and change the way of playing every week because then the player they will have nothing to to hold on, you know. Mm. So we, we, we stick to our basics and, and, and slowly we get better at them and then the player have a, a solid platform to, to, to compete. Mm -hmm. Do you think you learn from the experiences, not just the positive ones, but the ones that didn't work out for your coaching career? Because you're still very young in terms of coaching, but then, you know, you hear managers talk about they learned the most through the times where they didn't perform particularly well or the failing, the failures that they've experienced. Did you learn from, say, in Oxford where you went to first team management, didn't work out long term, so then you'll take the good bits you're doing and learn and, and move on? Oh yeah, massive. You, you learn massive 
from those moments because mm-hmm. they are they they kind of tragic mm-hmm. because in the end you th- you end up thinking okay what what, what could I have done better mm-hmm. you know and you kind of reflecting like that most of the time that reflection this kind of reflection we do with managers or we do with coaches mm-hmm. but the clubs don't do it the clubs they, they think it was the coach or the manager fault yeah. you know and and most of the time you end up thinking that you were alone on trying to do something mm-hmm. right and 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 it's not easy then to do things things alone, you know. So it was tough. So you end up learning the decision of the okay, look, next time it's better to say no. Next time it's better to say yes. Or look, they've been lying to me from the beginning, you know. Or they've been doing that for mm-hmm. me, so it's better not to go. You know? mm-hmm. So this kind of thing uh, gives you valuable lessons. Valuable lessons. It turns you more conservative as well. It turns you more conservative. I think. I think it's the same on everything in life. If first, when you start on something, you are eager that you want to achieve a success on whatever you do. The more you know about it, the more you think, well, wh- what I want to do is not achieve a failure, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. And then, so it's it's like in the end, you want to cut your losses, yeah, you know? Yeah. And, and let your, your, your winnings run, you know? <laughs> uh, not about uh, cutting your wins, you know? And, yeah, yeah. and letting your losses run. So mm-hmm. it's a little bit like that. So you learn, you learn that lesson. But I think, yeah, I reflect. But I reflect as well when things are going well because there's, there's, there's lessons as well. I think it's very important to know, even even if you put it through a game, why this game was not good enough for us. And as well, when you win, to analyze why you won, because maybe we won because, I don't know, maybe the opposition was unlucky or did something very bad. So And and then if you analyze that as well, you you always get to, to a balanced point. Don't think mm-hmm. that, oh, well, we've been over the roof because we are very good. And well, maybe you've been winning because they've been doing a lot of mistakes. You know? mm-hmm. So we've spoken about music, but I want to move on to some of your other hobbies away from football. I know you and I have had conversations about rock climbing in the yeah. past. Um, yeah. What's the story there? Because we are going to come along and we're going to get Dale up on the rocks with you at some point. But oh, really? what, what, what's your interest <laughs> there? I don't know if it is. Brilliant. I'm signing you up. You've yeah, never seen you've me agreed climb. to it now. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, I remember hmm. I, always, I always loved the exercise and especially the one that you do outdoors, yeah. you know. I'm lucky enough where, where we live near Barcelona. There's a lot of spots for for climbing, so almost everyone like does it. So I've been doing it for a lot of years. I haven't done it obviously when I started to 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 work abroad. Like Sweden is not a really good place to think that oh, I've got to spend the winter uh, winter days <laughs> trying to climb something because <laughs> maybe too much snow on it or no is the same. But but it's always something that I always l- liked it. You know, I always liked it even my. Uh, I'm waiting for my little one to be a bit older and, and mm-hmm. because it's, they love it and the kids love it. You know? So yeah, climbing, I've done it many, many times and, and being outdoors really, you know, but climbing, there's Montserrat is a, is a, a fantastic mountain near where I live. And there's, uh, I don't know, maybe more than 200 climbing paths there. So I've, I've done it all, all, all over. Enough it, so. to keep you busy. Yeah. Um, Dale, you mentioned it earlier about languages. Just how many languages do you speak, Pep? Well, I don't know. Let's say <laughs> we're not going to test you. Yeah, we're not going to test you. Show it some. You're safe here. <laughs> no worries. No, I speak Catalan, my, my mm-hmm. mother language, my mm-hmm. main language, and Spanish, bilingual on this, and then obviously English. You know, I, I learn, I learn German on the hard way because it's not easy to learn, mm-hmm. but I learn it, and I've done it many years. And obviously, when I worked in Sweden and in Norway, it's not like one of them that. You can um, you can speak the language, but you 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 can't get about enough to to the normal life. Yes, yeah. I made the effort there. Mm-hmm. I made the effort and to, to read and to and to speak and I even learned a lot about uh, Japanese because we're doing a lot of things uh, in Japan with Espanol, mm-hmm. and so we're traveling there. Maybe they've been there. We were there maybe ten times or something. So I had Japanese for two years classes and. And still remember it's, it's it it sounds odd, but it's very easy for Spaniards to learn it. Because, really? Yeah, because the vocal system we have is the same, so the pronunciation is the same. Okay. And it's a it's a kind of language that it's I think it's easier okay. to learn than what people think. Right. What is difficult is obviously to read, you know. Yeah. But but yeah, Jap- Japanese that I love it, and my level is not as with like German or yeah. because I don't I really don't use it, but yeah, those ones. And then obviously because I'm Catalan Spanish. Uh, it's easier for me to understand Portuguese and right. Italian, and so really, um, it's like like being home, really. Yeah, yeah. Do you, how do you learn through reading books? Do you say you had lessons? Is it well, just the languages? Yeah. 
English. I'm, I'm trying to learn Spanish, Pep, but right. I'm not going very well, to be honest. All right, then how I do it? Uh, English, I learned it in school. Mm -hmm. I never put any effort on it. Just came, just happened because mm -hmm. I started the early start when I was three years old. Right. Um, German, I learned it the hard way. Classes for five years, and in the Schule. Yeah, in the Schule, <laughs> and then a lot of travels to Germany to practice, and and then in university as well. I had to two years more of German, so the hard way. Mm -hmm. Still, is one of them that because you don't practice often, yeah. you know. Then I will need to recycle it, but now it will be easy for me to recycle. In six months, you know, we'll be back to back to normal. The others just picked up. Uh, I really never set my mind. Okay, no, I'm in Sweden. I want, I'm gonna learn Swedish in three months. It's not, that's impossible. You know, mm -hmm. for me to after sp after speaking different languages, what you end up learning is the most important thing is to understand uh, how the structure of the language work. You know, how do you say? Uh, the, the pronouns like mm -hmm. I, you, this, you know, mm -hmm. how they structure the verb, where do they put it in the, the syntax, where they put it in the, how they build the phrases, really, right. because then the basics, because then it's only about learning vocabulary. And so I think I think that's the easy way for me to do it. So mm -hmm. for me to learn it, that's the easy way. Mm -hmm. And then practice um, as soon as possible, learn as soon as possible, you need to learn, find someone if you want to learn Spanish, then mm. as soon as possible, you need to find someone who's Spanish like me, for example. And then... Are you putting yourself... Are you nominating yourself? <laughs> yeah, there's <that's laughs> no problem. And you only need to learn something like, how do you say this in Spanish? Yeah, yeah. Right? But you say this in Spanish, you know? And then I will tell, okay, in Spanish we say it like this, you know? And then you learn it, you know? And, and eventually you pick it up. But it, but it turns out to be, if you want to learn a language, yeah, you need to go yeah, uh, when, it's been, when you need it. Yeah, when, yeah, yeah, where you need it. How quickly do you learn how to swear in that language. <laughs> oh, that's where you take your day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take your day. Yeah. Um, I, know, I know swearing on every language. <laughs> Don't uh, test that. No. <laughs> we've gone rock climbing, music, football. I've got here to mention chess, Pep. Why is chess um, something that you've spoke about in a few interviews? Because you're a particularly good player. And your father was a champion chess player. Yeah, he was a champion in, in Spain. And it's been in the family, I think, forever. Right. Because as far as I remember, my grandma, I, I know he was playing. He put it into my dad. My dad was playing. He got better than my, my granddad. Mm -hmm. And then he put it into me. And I must be like my granddad because I'm not better than my father. <laughs> yeah, you let the family down. Maybe my one, my, my little one, will be better than, <laughs> than my father. I know. Uh, yeah, it's been there. I think it's the same as when I was learning English. It was in the family, so I learned it since I was a kid. Yeah. And it, I think it does help. It, it, it widens up, it helps you mathematically. Helps Strategies. You with, yeah, logical mm -hmm. thinking, rationality of things. I think it, it does help. It's really difficult. I can always say that. Mm. I love that game, mm. but it's so difficult. <laughs> I, uh, I put um, a, an app on the, on the iPad, mm. a really, really good app for learning, really, uh, for, for practicing. Mm. And I always said, okay, the first... It starts and, and tells you, okay, when do you want to finish that learning, right? So you need to put a date. And I was a little bit naive. I said, okay, okay I start today, let's say uh, three months. And the app still said, no, no, that's not possible. You know? <laughs> so I put, okay, a year, no, that's not possible, right? So I put three years, right? I'm using this app since 2014, I think, or 15, right. I remember. Uh, and I'm checking, and I, I do, like, it practices strategies, practices tactics, it practices openings, wow. it practices end game. Right? Okay, I've done maybe, I was doing it on the plane the, the other day. <laughs> uh, I do it at home, I try to so do four, 15, 20 yeah. minutes. You know, it's okay. like it's like doing homework. Right? Every day, okay. Yeah, so what, like for example, it's like, I don't have the app here, otherwise I'll show you. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what's the best play here? Right? In, in this scenario? Yeah, in this scenario, what what's to the do? best play? Okay. There's only one, this is the best one, right? So you need to find it out, and it goes by time. Whoa. And then another one, what's the best play here? What's the best play here? And it could be one move combination or two or three moves combination. Right? Wow. So every unit or every lesson, I know it's 150 of these scenarios, right? And that might be a unit, right? And after one doing progress, you know, because I, I'm doing a lot, you know. So I checked the other day and I get a message, say, listen, you said that you want to be finished this program in two or three years, I don't remember. Uh, by the time that you're putting into it, and I'm putting 15 minutes a day, right? 
you're going to be finishing this on 2025. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, wow. <laughs> then I realized, wow, yeah. that's tough. So yeah. that's tough. That means that, yeah, grandmasters in chess is because they put a lot of, wow. they, they have the ability, but they put a lot of hours in it. Yeah. Because it really, it really, it's, um, it's about learning, you know, and, and realizing yourself and, and positions and things. You know? But it's a lot. I love the game. I yeah. love the game. Yeah. Do you play on a timer? Do you, when you play against people, you, because obviously it's against the clock as well. Yeah. So you play as yeah. professionally as you can. Yeah. I find that quite amazing. Yeah. And every tournament you need to play with the timer, otherwise, like. You go on forever. Yeah. Well, they are set on the timer. So some, some tournaments that you have five minutes, mm -hmm. some tournaments that's a quick one, some tournaments you will have two hours each, each player, mm -hmm. or an hour and a half, or, or, or an hour to do that certain amount of moves, mm -hmm. and then it, you have an extra one. So. I haven't been competing since really I started seriously with the football. I, I was not, but before I was attending, attending a lot of a lot of tournaments. Really? Yeah. So you've seen them, those guys in America who play, don't know, have you seen them in like yeah. Central Park and they'll play people for five dollars or every month? Yeah. Would you fancy your chances against one of those guys? Yeah, I would love to. <laughs> but I don't set that up. I, I, yeah, I'd be great, but I don't think I would win. <laughs> they uh, play every day. That's how you learn it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, we've got to touch upon this weekend if we can. Yeah. One of your old clubs, of course. How do you look back on your? time at Leeds and the reason why I ask is whenever uh, you get anything online on Twitter in particular from Leeds fans they still have a fun memory of you and your time that you had there which I find quite interesting given their opposite opinion of the gaffer so I find, <laughs> that, I find that quite an interesting dynamic uh, I think I think we did a really good job mm -hmm. at Leeds uh, from the personal point of view I was really, really happy there mm -hmm. I enjoyed my time a lot uh, I would not have minded to stay there 10 years because I, I really found, wow, this, this looks like my place, you know. Mm. Uh, nice club and, and I like the atmosphere in the stadium and, and people were so passionate about the club and 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 it was a pity. Gaffer decided to obviously to go to Middlesbrough and, and fans didn't took it right. I just I just saw my contract finish and I was mm. made it clear that if hey, Leeds wants, wants me to stay or well, then obviously, uh, for me, I'm very happy here. Yeah. But obviously, if you have other plans, there's no problem. Then I'll move on. So, but I have a lot of respect for that club because I know how hard they suffered, you know, and 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 it's a it's a club that deserves to be in the Premier League as well as Birmingham, you know. But obviously, the Premier League is only for uh, only 20, 20 teams can be there, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. But a little bit that's that's my feeling with it. So I was so happy. People welcomed me very well, supported me always. Mm -hmm. The fans were always on the side of the team. Mm -hmm. um, it was with the chairman there, Massimo Cellino, who I think he did a good job for for the structure of the club and structure of the team, and 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 he, and, and he kept us the, the the whole season and helped us to 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 do a, a stabi stabilize the team very well. We almost made the playoff. That's yeah. something that I always have a what a pity, you know, mm -hmm. because we I think we deserved it, but that, that that's again how it is, you know, and I, and every time. Uh, and I made a lot of friends, really, and 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 <clears throat> and every time I'm in Leeds, so I go, I go see them. I have contact with everyone who works mm -hmm. there still, so it's a very nice game for me. Mm -hmm. uh, it's more special when you go to Ellen Road, really, yeah, than yeah. when they come here. But yeah, but it, it would be great. Yeah, the manager spoke, I think, a few times about the similarities when they you first went into Leeds, and it was a little bit of turmoil. The connection wasn't quite there with the supporters. Do you see that? the similar story that's emerging here at, at Blues? Yeah, I think so. I think so. Um, but I would like, I really like, I really like Leeds fans because they're very passionate about, about the club. And I really like Birmingham fans because they're passionate as well. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, uh, they know where, how hard are things to achieve, you know, mm -hmm. and where we come from. And, and, and they know they have to get behind us and behind the lights and behind the team and, and and this is something that you don't find very very common, and mm -hmm. and this is something we have all here all together, mm -hmm. and that makes us very very proud of it because uh, it's a place that you feel okay everything is in synergy or in connection mm -hmm. so we can we can build something you know. Mm -hmm. um, when you think of Leeds, that seventh place finish, it was a very young team. Yeah. Given the time, do you think you'd have been even more successful there over a number of years? Yeah, if we could have. If we have stayed there mm -hmm. and what more, yeah, I think so. Mm -hmm. I think so because we put a very solid foundations in the team. Uh, the team was young and achieved the seventh place in the league, very young. Mm -hmm. And we were able to hold all those players and be very selective on, on recruitment, mm -hmm. you know. But Leeds changed, changed the, obviously, another gaffer came in and, and they changed a little bit the, the, 
the the recruitment process and then they, they brought a lot of players and and a little bit that mentality and that and that that work was a little bit broken mm -hmm. to try to do something else that I always respected, you know, but obviously you get back to square one. Yeah. I think here in Birmingham we put some basis basics last season and and we, we were able to carry on those basics this season. Mm -hmm. And despite what happened, I, I think everyone is happy that we we're doing a good season, mm -hmm. you know. And it's something that is more basics on the same things that adds on the next season. Yeah. Going off that, then is this summer quite a big summer for the club, given the fact that the points deduction's been and gone now, the embargo isn't there for the summer, no points deduction to start next season, so it could be quite an important summer for the club. Yeah, very important, especially because as well, this is a, there has been. Um, it's another like setback what happened to us with the, with the points things and, and we need to reflect on it as well mm -hmm. why this happened and, and what can we do better so this doesn't happen to us mm -hmm. and make sure that we stick to that and then we build the club forward on a, on a pace that the club can hold mm -hmm. because if you try to get a, a quicker pace than normal then obviously then these things happen mm -hmm. and and I think the club is in, is in a good position now to, to be able to use this summer and use next season to, to keep building and, and, and keep getting us closer to where we deserve to be and, mm -hmm. and, and just take steps in the next direction. I don't know if, if Birmingham uh, is going to be uh, achieving a really good position in the league or, or, or going up or something. Mm -hmm. This we don't know. This is the future. No one knows. So what we can control and what we know is let's put steps in the right direction every time all together the fans and the club don't repeat the mistakes we've done in the past or don't try to repeat them and slowly we, we gotta keep growing you know? mm -hmm. and it seems like you feel settled here in the club and in the city you've been out feeding the homeless with the jeff horsfield foundation you put a coaching session on for a grassroots team yeah. as well do you feel settled in the area now oh yeah a lot a lot for me it's very handy i love birmingham mm -hmm. i live uh, I live uh, near the city centre. Mm -hmm. I know I know my neighbourhood. I know the other the other neighbourhoods around. And and for me and my family, it's very handy because we have the airport as massive connections. And and it's in a part of the country that is lovely. We go a lot to the Cotswolds or to Oxford or, mm -hmm. or or even the city Birmingham. I think is is a is a fantastic city. I think Birmingham is better than what Birmingham thinks. Mm -hmm. You know. Yeah. And 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 I really I'm really enjoying it. So I I hope that we can. We can yeah. keep working and, 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 and keep building things here because uh, it, the city amazes me mm -hmm. and, and the people amazes me. And, and obviously, this with, with Jeff, we've done a lot of things, you know, I, mm -hmm. uh, the club mainly. And, and, and this, the gradual thing is yes, things that, that, mm -hmm. that I always, you know, just give back. And, but I do it because I fancy it, because mm -hmm. I, I like it, not because I feel like I have to. Mm -hmm. Finally, from me, would you turn your hand at first team management again further down the line? Uh, yeah, yeah, you know, it, there's again talking about future. No one, no Who one knows. knows. No yeah. one knows. But I really enjoy. I really enjoy working with Gary. I really enjoy uh, working for Birmingham, mm -hmm. and uh, that's that's my my only thing, you know. And uh, no, that was a manager. That was a manager's answer. That was that was a very <laughs> experienced manager. Wasn't it? Safe answer. <laughs> that was, but it's a good answer. No, but it's actually it's the truth. <laughs> no, you know? I, I, you. I haven't lied. The whole thing. <laughs> nah. Uh, see, I cannot be a politician. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note, I think that seems like a perfect yeah. time to end. Pep, thank you very much for joining us on much. Blues Talk. No worries. The Blues Talk Podcast with Dale Moon and Callum Denning. What a man. Pep Clotet. Yeah, yeah, I think he's made a big difference. If you look at, um, you know, I know he went to Oxford to try his hand at first yeah. team management, but I think he works with the gaffer really well. You can see that they are keen to share ideas and not afraid to disagree sometimes it's a very healthy relationship that they have and I think Gary Monk's a better manager when Pep's at his yeah. side the Aussie Osborne of Barcelona I know, yeah, he's heavy, he like it. it's not my sort of music I've got to be honest I know Tats is a fan no, do you not fancy going um, to see Black Sabbath with him? Then that's not me that no I know he's a, he's a, big, he's a big heavy metal fan I know and Tats is um Pass you to a bit of rock as well on our way to games, but and then um, rock climbing from heavy yeah. metal rock to rock climbing just as well. Just loves so. rocks. Man of many talents. <laughs> just, just can't get enough rocks, can he, Pep? <laughs> anyway, let's uh, move swiftly on from rocks to uh, a team whose world we rocked at Ellen Road with their first defeat of the seat. That's an awful. That was segue. a stretch of a segue. Yeah, I know. <laughs> anyway, we beat them at Ellen Road. It was their first defeat of the yeah. season. Are we going to do it again at St Andrews Dale? It's the type of game where it wouldn't surprise you if Blues did get a result. Hopefully we get some nice spring weather down here as well. Mm -hmm. Leeds will bring a good following. The atmosphere will be good. 
And putting all that aside, Blues need points now. Yeah. We find ourselves in a, in a bit of a sticky predicament um, down at the wrong end of the table. So, uh, I wouldn't put it past Blues getting a result. Leeds will come at us, uh, as they did in the first game at Ellen Road. Uh, like to play a slick, fluid style of football. Hernandez has been fantastic for them. Um, Roof, Kimar Roof could be back. He's back in training this week. So he has trained. Um, he's a big plus. Their top goal scorer, I think he's on 14. Local lad as well. Yeah. So um, he'll look forward to it. But it's got all the makings of a really good game. Two really good clubs. Mm. Be a good atmosphere. They both have something to play for. We need the points. So do they. Um, but going back to that game at, at Ellen Road, I sat next to you to watch that one. Yeah. And um, I just thought we got, I think it, Bielsa admitted after the game, he got. He made a sub in the first half quite early on. He did. Um, I made a change of tactics because he felt that Blues were just getting on top of them. And I, just as Blues were starting to form that reputation of being a counter-attacking team, it was our first win of the season. It was, Wasn't which it? is weird yeah. to think about. And I think, again, most Blues fans went to Ellen Road thinking it'd be so Blues if our first win was against one of the sides that were riding high in the automatic spots. you tweeted it pre-match. Yeah, I think it it just had all the hallmarks of a Blues result. Um, But that's when Shea clicked. I think the gaffer had words with him ahead of the game. You know, needed a bit more from him. Mm -hmm. Made him try try to make him understand that the work rate that has to go along with the talent and the goal scoring. And since then, he's just taken off, hasn't he? The domino effect, isn't it? Yeah. He's too ri- he actually disguises his finishes really well. The first one, it looks like the keeper makes an error. All of his weight's going the one way. Just hides it behind the defender and whips it towards the near post. And the second one, how he manages to swivel and put it back in the other corner. It's two really good finishes. And we've seen that from Shea. I think we were talking ahead of the, the West Brom game. Very few goals. They're not tapping. I don't want to have Shea down as the poacher of a Shea Adams. No, as a he's, poacher he's a striker. striker of the ball, isn't he? He seems to create goals himself. That's what I think the commentator, if it's me or Jonathan Bell, whoever it is, are so surprised in their commentary um, because he seems to create a goal out of nothing. Swansea away. There was nothing on there. No, he from, just whips it into yeah, top bins. Yeah, and there's goals here where he has a, a run down the side and opens his body up and fires it across yeah. goal. Um, as a striker of the ball... Uh, it's quite emphatic sometimes, Shane. Yeah. He does take you by surprise. So, um, But he'll want to score. I mean, I'm trying to think of the last Shay Adams goal as I sit here. He's probably going through a run of three or four games. QPR? Um, possibly the 4-3 the at yeah. QPR. Uh, we might be wrong, but he, he'll want to be on the score sheet again and get back to scoring. So an incentive for both sides to go and win the game that might, may well play into Blues' hands. You know, If you look at the blueprint as to the, the games that Blues have won this year against the better sides... It's been when they've overcommitted players forwards. Uh, we've been solid at the back and we've hit them on the counter attack. And I think that's how Gary Monk will be hoping it pans out on on Saturday. Two against Blackburn. We were wrong. Two against Those Blackburn. Are the last two goals. There you go. Right, Sheffield United, Bramall Lane. Again, we didn't get the win there. It was nil nil, but we should have done, shouldn't we? Yeah, I think so. Again, another side who were very good. Um, so it'll be two tough games in the space of four days but a side who we've watched I've watched quite a bit over the past few years mm. they play 3-5-2 better than any team in this division they're comfortable at it now Wilder plays it he's played it for the last few years um, the two centre-halves either side of Egan Basham and O'Connell very high wide centre-halves mm. make it difficult to follow so Duke and Shea won't be able to stay narrow as they normally do um, Sharp's got goals he's born and bred Sheffield United fan as is Wilder yeah uh, and I'm actually pleased to see them doing well although it's a Blues podcast and we're obviously Blues fans but you know they're a, they're a proper club and a bit like Blues the club of the city uh, haven't had the history and all the the, the silverware to go with their, their rivals but mm-hmm. um, it's a good stadium good old fashioned stadium and they've been absolutely flying I think they're the one of the sides the pressure's not quite on Sheffield United, although they find themselves up there now. Um, they slipped up against Bristol City and they'll be disappointed to have fallen out of the automatic spots. But um, they're the dark horses, really, that have just stayed in there and been in, in and around it. And they're one of definitely three sides who could make them automatic spots. So you'd, th- you'd think, I don't know what you, your thoughts are on this, but you'd think Norwich are away. I think so, yeah. Um, I think they've got a lot of quality in that side. They've done, just done, they've done ever so well. And then it's that second spot between Leeds Leeds and Sheffield United. But if you ask West Brom, they'll say they're not out of it as well. Listen, I said before we start recording this, I've got a lot of time for a team that has an anthem about greasy <laughs> chip butties. It's a great uh, anthem. Honestly. It is a great anthem. And they cut it off at the right moment. And they all take part in it. Um, it's very unique. I don't think you're going to find other clubs copying that one. I keep hearing clubs singing the Liverpool Alley Alley. So yeah, West, West Brom. West Brom are guilty of it. 
uh, our friends from the other side of the city uh-huh. were guilty of it. I don't know what your thoughts are on it, but for me, I'm not a fan of... I know there will be songs that the lyrics are changed for, yeah. depending on what club you are, but for that one, it just seemed a Liverpool song that now clubs seem to think it's they kind can... kind of like a bandwagon. I've noticed in recent years, we're on our way, which we've been singing here for years and years and years, I think Sunderland as well. Mm. Suddenly that's become the chant that every team's got. Yeah. It's, it's strange. It's nice that we do have a bit like Leeds and Sheffield United, an anthem. Yeah. You know, that marching on together and Leeds get going, that's mm-hmm. just theirs. Incredible song. And I think, I know we are biased, but fans of other clubs will admit that Keep Right On mm-hmm. is an absolute anthem and no one else has obviously will touch it. But uh, yeah, I just find the LA LA one a little bit cringeworthy yeah. for me. There's some blues now have, as well as, like you said, we are looking behind us at the other end of the table. We've got a weird input now on the promotion battle. The two teams that are going for that second automatic place, Leeds mm. and Sheffield United. Leeds, I think, are going to have that extra spring in their step. They almost didn't have it, Alan Road. Bielsa will have done his research meticulously. He's probably listened to this now, so <laughs> Marcelo, thank you very much. Um, got to ask, any sign of them at the Trillion Trophy Centre this week? I haven't seen anyone no. uh, in the woods. No, Nothing. I haven't. No, it was amazing when that all came out, wasn't it? But we spoke about typical blues and getting wins when our backs were against the wall, I said earlier, when we least expect it. Do you fancy us maybe to get six points coming up? <laughs> It'd be a big ask, wouldn't it, yeah. to, to go again, given that how, how short, small our squad is. Um, and they've played so much football just as the same 11. We have a settled 11. Everyone knows yeah, who the, yeah. the 11 is. So you've asked a lot of them to get this far. But they have to find another gear again, given what's happened during the week with the points deduction. I think Lukas Jukovic came out after the West Bromwich Albion game and said, we haven't got time to feel sorry for ourselves. Yeah, we're disappointed that you know we, we were challenging for a playoff spot and that seems to have fallen away now. But we simply haven't got time at this stage of the season to dwell on it. So they need to find another gear and a second wind with seven games remaining. Um, but like we say, this is, these are the occasions that Blues supporters and players seem to relish. Um, Leeds will arrive four of the last five. They've won. They're in good form. Um, but I quietly fancy us on Saturday. I'll stick my neck on the chopping board and I fancy us on, um, I fancy us on Saturday. Well, audio commentary of that one exclusively here on Blues TV. Critical Kevin Broadhurst He's, alongside Jonathan yeah, Bell. The dream back. team. He puts himself down for certain games, Kev. But yeah, coming from uh, Yorkshire, proud Yorkshireman, gives it loads about being from Leeds. So he's um, yeah, he'll be alongside Jonathan Bell, just criticising everything, everyone, and whatever moves really. But Might get uh, he a bit loves too it. Two really. Yorkshire on commentary. He loves it really. Nah, Kev's good as gold. He loves it really. And uh, Mm. video coverage available in select markets internationally. Mm. Same for uh, Sheffield United, incidentally. Killing us. The league are killing us. Anyway, we move on. Quick fire questions. Let's have it with a little bit of a difference this week. You went down to the Trillion Trophy Train Centre. I think you're going to need to set this one up a little bit. Who did you speak to? I spoke to a very, very colourful character at the training ground who is the team behind the team. He's someone who makes his opinions known. Stinks of Cockney East London. Massively. Uh, but is a blue nose for him for really. Uh, he's been at the club for a few years now, and he's none other than our kit man, it's JP. The Blues Talk Podcast. What music do you, do you listen to before a game in the dressing room? Me or... You. 80s. Snapchat story or Instagram stories? Instagram. What's your favourite restaurant to eat at? Morton's Berkeley Square. Nice. What's your karaoke song? Hi-O Silver Lining. Favourite movie? Contraband. Which country produces the best food? Italy. What's your middle name? Don't have one. What's your ideal holiday destination? Beach. Dubai. (laughs) Favourite TV series? Only Falls and Horses. What do you order from a coffee shop? Latte. What's the best goal you've seen on the pitch or whilst sitting in the dugouts? A tough one, I know. Uh, Shea Adams, Bristol City. Did you have any posters on your bedroom wall growing up? Keep it clean. Yeah, football squads, shoot and match magazine. Uh, Michael Morrison had the same. Uh, have you met your sporting hero? Yes. Who is it? Paul Gascoigne. Uh, what, instruction, <laughs> what instruction do you give to the barbers when they ask how you want your hair doing? Number one all over. <laughs> what is your favourite cheat meal or dirty meal? Uh, fish and chips 
Uh, what did you go dressed as to the last fancy dress party you attended? A football player. <laughs> NBA, NFL, Major League Baseball, do you not care about any of them? Do you follow a team? NFL, Chicago Bears. What's the name of the WhatsApp groups you're part of other than the clubs one? Uh, I don't think I am actually. Oh, Personal okay. ones, no. Can you play a musical instrument? No. One person dead or alive you'd invite to a dinner party? David Beckham. Can you speak another language? Cockney. <laughs> and not very well. <laughs> uh, which Hollywood actor would you choose to play yourself in a movie? Mark Wahlberg. If the whole squad had a Royal Rumble, who would be left in the ring at the end? Harley Dane. Three words to describe your blues roommate. Chris Shute. I don't have one. Chris Shute. Oh, listen to how big time that is. <laughs> Chris Shute, nice Irish. guy. Okay, that's two words, but fine. <laughs> Best pair of trainers or boots you've ever owned? Reebok Workout Plus. Uh, what jam on your pizza? Pepperoni. Boring. Favourite flavour ice cream? Coffee. Awful shout. Uh, after save a choice? Sauvage. Nice. Yeah, if you could be any nationality other than your own, what would it be? Italian. What are the names of the pets you and your family have owned? Emma. Cokney. <laughs> Vinny. Cokney? Cokney. Different. Most played song or album? Oasis. Uh, have you got any tattoos? No. What type of student were you at school? Busy one. Shock. What uh, is the strangest thing you've eaten? Locusts. Mm. Uh, anything on your bucket list? Super Bowl. Do you have any reoccurring dreams? No. What's the worst item of clothing you've ever worn? A Hawaiian shirt. Oh. Uh, are you addicted to anything? Collecting football shirts. What are you most afraid of? Not being liked. What word do you dislike? Chill, right. chill your beans. Oh, yeah. Uh, Favourite city other than Birmingham? Chicago. What's the best way to eat chicken and how would you have it flavoured? With your hands. Spicy. What, what what part of the chicken would you eat? Oh, are you a breast, are you a wing, breast, are you a leg? Breast, oh, breast. Spicy breast. Yeah. Uh, what are your thoughts on fishing? Boring. Have you got, what's your favourite piece of memorabilia? David Beckham shirt. And finally... Nine or Messi shirt, sorry. Oh. And finally, have you ever read a book cover to cover? And what books? Yes, a lot of old biographies. I've oh, got a few. Yeah. Bookworm. A little bit, yeah, when I get into one, I'll read one. The Blues Talk Podcast with Dale Moon and Callum Denning. Our very own head kit man, JP, with quick fire questions. It's a bit different. Yeah, big Blues Talk de- uh, debut for JP. Yeah, I know he's a big fan. He's asked me um, many times when I'm going to be on. Almost as many times as Sean Rush, I think, has asked us when he's going to be yeah, on. Yeah, no, we do need to get Rush on because he's another one. There's some great characters at the club at yeah, the minute and absolutely. it all helps to that togetherness and they're all bring their own little flavour to the what is a lively training ground but a great atmosphere down there whenever we go down now um, and it hasn't always been that way but a great atmosphere whenever you go down there so no, it's good to get um, JP on and we'll hopefully get some more team behind the team features for the next few uh, editions one of the reasons for the difference in form I think between this season and the last the atmosphere at the training ground now it's somewhere you yeah. want to be, isn't it? Yeah, I think so. It's a welcoming place, but there's a togetherness, but there's a work ethic about them. Like, yeah, they are open in terms of, you know, any fan initiatives that they do. They're happy to meet people. It's an open door training ground um, in that sense. But when it's time to work, it's time to work. And I just think um, they've been brilliant. That all adds to the culture at the training ground. Uh, the backroom staff are a big part of that. JP plays his part as well. Um I think with I don't know if anyone's watched the Man City documentary that was on Netflix, but I think the kit man had his own full episode sometimes. Yeah. I think you can sometimes forget that yeah, the players obviously are extremely important and the backroom staff, but there are personalities around a club who spend a lot of time, you know, the chef, the kit men, the sports science guys, analysts that all play their part. And I think just in creating that upbeat atmosphere, you go down there and you can have a laugh and uh have a good chat about the football and um JP is certainly one of them, so it's good to hear from him. Now, we'll talk a little bit about the running in just a moment. One of the things we didn't touch on um, in depth when we spoke about the PNS Commission is the ramifications now. Obviously, no embargo mm-hmm. next summer. 
it gives the gaffer, as you said just now to me, off a bit of an opportunity to put his own stamp on the team. Yeah, I think so. That's what every manager wants, don't they? I mean, Gary Monk's come in working on a shoestring, so there was obviously limitations to what he could do in January. He managed to get a few players in, and in the summer, so Kerry Marabti in January, and then the same in the summer with Gardner and Camp, Bogle. Um, but given the fact that now they there is no embargo, the purse strings will be loosened a little bit. That's not to say it's a blank check. That's not to say that all of a sudden he's going to have a war chest of X million to go and splash. It's got to be done in a considered, careful way. But what it does do, it gives the manager um, an opportunity for him to mould a team fit for what he sees as a, a competitive championship side. And again, he won't get carried away. You know, touch wood, we accumulate enough points between now and the end of the season to remain in the championship. I'd imagine the manager, without putting words in his mouth, won't be saying anything to do with challenging, playoffs. Again, it's got to be small steps. Yeah. And I think he's a manager that has the bigger picture in mind. Someone that sees that you have to put the infrastructure in place at a club to really have a good go. And there will always be exceptions. There'll be clubs that attain promotion and they aren't quite ready and you see them drop straight through back down to the championship. But you have to put the building blocks in place. And, he's, and Gary Monk strikes me as a manager who... Who, uh, who will do that. Um, but the fact that the embargo is lifted, uh, it's a big relief. And a, a bit, for me, it just means that the manager now can really start to put some bodies into what's been a small squad, uh, offer contracts to players who he hasn't been able to negotiate with um, and just start to put the, the building blocks in place for the next two, three seasons. Well, the theme of the podcast, I think, has been clarity. You say there about offering contracts to players that he hasn't been able to speak to. We saw uh, a week or two ago, Charlie Lakin, mm -hmm. his contract extension has now been sanctioned by yeah. the FL. Uh, one man that has been like the subject of speculation all season is the captain, Michael Morrison. Mm. We now know that we can sit down and start talking about a new deal. Yeah. How important is that going to be to get his deal extended? Yeah, he, I mean, a great, another character around the, the place is a, is a leader, part of that senior group now. And he's seen a fair few managers here at, at the club and he's remained. Gary Rowett's first signing, I yeah, believe. Yeah, and so um, knows the area, settled, and he's, you know, he's solid, isn't he? A solid championship centre-half and you want to be having that sort of players in your squad. Mm -hmm. um, good influence and... I just think um, the longer it goes on, the more uncertainty. It all adds to a busier summer than it needs to be. You want to get your players in place well in advance of any pre-season tours or any friendlies that might come on. Um, so, yeah, it's good news that finally now we can start to talk to these sorts of players. Gary Gardner is a player who will obviously go back after his loan. Yeah. Will there be interest in bringing him back? We'll wait and see. Looks like he's enjoyed his time here. If his celebration's anything to go by, I think he, if you ask him, he's playing some of his best football of his career. I know he's been hampered with injuries in the past, but he's another player who's really impressed us, especially given the fact that it's a difficult job to come across the city yeah. from a near rival. And no one's talking about that. It's all been about his influence on the pitch. And he's formed a relationship um, with the Blue Sands as well, yeah. hasn't he? Almost immediately. Yeah, yeah. And that's through performing well, and it yeah. only comes through performing. Let you talk in... Uh, let you do your talking on the pitch, and that's yeah. what he's done. Um, so there's all these sorts of things now that hopefully with this clarity that uh, the verdicts will give us will help just to settle things down a little bit. Like I say, we can get over the finish line and start to plan for the near future. Right. I think this is going to be a running theme now until we get to that Reading game at the end of the season. But let's look at the run-in. We spoke about Leeds. We spoke about Sheffield United. We then get in to Easter. Mm. Derby, Rotherham. Then we move on. Ipswich, Wigan, Reading. Yeah. Big games. Yeah, uh, Easter, Derby could still very well be in the mix with the playoff places. They want to cement that. You look at how tight it is, especially for that fifth and sixth place. There's yeah. still a handful of teams all vying for that. So they'll have something to play for. Rotherham, they could be fighting for their lives. Um, you know, they've picked up a couple of wins in their last six, but got absolutely thumped last time out by Derby, yeah. funnily enough. So um, that'll be a big game. We'll take a, a decent following to the New York City Stadium. Um, Still a very weird name, by the way. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, they're all big games. Uh, Wigan, form's not great on the road. Yeah. Does suit Blues. Obviously went there and, and won comfortably, but that, that'll suit Blues. That'll be one that... Know, it's difficult because whenever you come up against these sides down there, you're never too confident, but it is one on paper that Blues will fancy. Uh, it switch away, a bit of a jaunt, but struggled this season. They're gone, aren't they? They struggled this season, so... 
another opportunity to pick up points. And then Reading away on the final day. We've got great form there on the last day of the season. Super, super Kev. Um, yeah, from, from the last episode. Um, so they're all games where, listen, it don't matter whether it's Leeds United at the top and Sheffield United, Ipswich and Rotherham down the bottom. You have to go out. And I think the manager sums it up perfectly. This is a side and a squad of players who can't afford to be at 70, 75%. They have to be at it. And I've said it before, I think you can tell with this group of players after 10 minutes of a game whether they're going to be at it or not. I think at Millwall and Bolton down here, you knew straight away it was going to be flat. And then I think back to Stoke away or even at West Brom for the first 10 minutes, we were bang at it. Don't guarantee a result, but they have to be all firing on all cylinders. And that's all you want to see now. One big gargantuan effort in the last seven games to get us over the line. Well, the next time we're back, we should be uh, through that run-in and know yeah. kind of where we're standing going into uh, our final fixtures. Hopefully, safety all but secured. Yeah, it'd be nice, wouldn't it? Uh, the, the good thing is there's a few teams between the relegation zone and ourselves. They've all got to have a good run. I don't want to tempt fate. I do think it switch are gone. Mm-hmm. I think it might just be the one place that Blues are trying to avoid being sucked into now. So... Um, yeah, hopefully we're sitting here in a few weeks' time. A few point more points on the board, creeping towards that 50 points mark, which we had already yeah. achieved. Back towards that. Yeah, for the second time this season. And uh, it's a little bit of an easier finish. But would it be Blues if that was the case? I don't think so. I think there's some fans who genuinely would like to see us with something riding on the Reading game because it's just so Blues. It's the way we do it. Relegation or promotion battle last day of the season. Right. Has to be done. Never a dull moment. Right, until then, thank you for listening. Thank you to Pep Clotet and to JP for joining us. I've been Callum Denning. And I've been Dal Moon. This has been Blues Talk.